Good morning, Meadowbrook Church. And give it up for Brady and those announcements. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it's uh, happy Fourth of July weekend to you all. It's good to see you. Welcome to Meadowbrook Church. If you've been coming for a long time or this is your first time, if you're here in person or online, welcome. We're glad you're here and it's so good to see you all. Uh, my name is Craig. I'm the student ministry director here. I'm on staff here at Meadowbrook Church. Uh, my wife, Kelsey, and I have called Meadowbrook uh, our home for seven years. And so we, uh, we've got three little kids, Lila, Lincoln, and Leo are our little ones. And I wanted to share with you just something that's happened recently. A few weeks ago, we had the opportunity as a family to travel up to Fort Wilderness and Rhinelander to speak at, at camp there, speaking to um, seventh and ninth grade students. And I didn't tell them this, but it was my first time doing that, so that's a little nerve-wracking. Um, but to help break the ice a little bit every session, because I spoke like 10 or 11 or 12 times, every session I would give out pictures that Lila had color colored. She's four. Um, I had so many, and I, as a, a dad, I just can't throw them away. My wife calls me a hoarder, but I'm nostalgic, okay? Um, and so I had all these pictures, and she, she's really creative. She loves coloring, whether it's coloring pages or doing her own thing. It's really sweet, and it's really, really special. And I wanted to, just to show you and share you, with you what she does. This is something I got for Father's Day a couple of years ago. It might be a little bit hard to see, um, but she's really great with her letters and her printing. And she signs her name, L-I-L-A-H, and then she puts a little T at the end. Uh, it looks like a T, but it's actually a cross. And that was her. You know, you might think, oh, yeah, her dad works at a church. I, I, didn't, I didn't do it. It just started happening. Asked my wife. And we're like, what, why, what is that T behind your name? She's like, it's a cross. So people know about Jesus. I was like, oh, girl. Um, so we call it Lila's Coloring Ministry, right? She's got all these little pictures and pages, and she signs her name, and she puts a cross behind her name because she wants people to know about Jesus. Um, and it's sweet, and it's simple, um, and it's a salvation moment, right? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but so that sweet, simple, and salvation moment is similar to what I want to talk to you about this morning, and similar to our text, and similar to my main point this morning that we're going to pull from uh, Romans 9, and that's to be burdened to point people to Christ. And we need to be burdened to point people to Christ. So I want, you to invite, I want to invite you to turn to Romans 9, if you haven't already. If you're using our in-house Bibles, 1134 is the page. And while you're turning there, here's a brief explanation about what we're going to step into. Um, Romans 9 through 11 is somewhat of a digression from um, chapters 8 and then, you know, before 12. It kind of takes a step away from where Paul's headed and where Paul's going. Uh, some Bible scholars feel like this uh, passage doesn't have any relevance to the church at all. However, as we'll see from going through these verses, that there are truths that have to be understood. Up until this point, the author of Romans, Paul, has been about the task of proving that salvation is a sovereign work of God brought about through grace, by faith. And so by telling his readers that men are saved by trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ, you know, any Jewish people, any Jews reading Romans or listening to this in this time period um, might get the idea that salvation by faith was for Gentiles only, right? And so scripture uses the words Jews and Gentiles a lot, right? Jewish people, the chosen holy people of God. Gentiles is everybody else, right? And so a Jewish person might hearing the words of Paul, hearing his teaching, reading his letter, you know, they might come to the conclusion that there's no hope for them who are descendants of Abraham. And therefore, Paul pauses in his teaching. And this is what we see in Romans 9. He pauses to let all of his readers know that God wasn't finished with the Jewish people that they're still figured prominently into God's 
plan for the future. So Romans 9 is an explanation for why the word of God has not failed, even though God's chosen people, Israel, are not turning to Christ and being saved. So the sovereignty of God's grace is brought in this final ground of God's faithfulness in spite of Israel's failure and therefore, you know, as the deepest foundation for these precious promises that we see in Romans 8. Romans 8, as we read, is just a beautiful um, passage of Scripture. And so there's promises made there, and Paul still is kind of confirming and affirming that in, in Romans 9. So um, let me pray really quick, and we'll jump right into the first five verses of Romans 9. God, thank you for gathering us here together this morning. Thank you for letting us be a church, a part of your body. God, we thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for Paul's heart, uh, for his desire for people to know Christ and Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, Christ as Savior and Lord. I pray that for those of us who know that today, that we can be burdened to point people to Christ. And for those of us who don't know that today, that we can desire to know more and be in relationship with him. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Romans 9, 1 through 5. I'm so used to being with students and being at camp and doing Bible studies, I almost asked somebody to stand up and read. Um, sorry. <laughs> Romans 9, 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience, con- my conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs, the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So in these opening verses of, of Romans 9, Paul reveals his heart for his people, right? He calls them his people, his race, his kinsmen, right? The Jews. And so in doing so, he teaches us a lesson about the kind of heart that we should have for the lost around us. And so these first three verses really start to expose Paul's heart for those who are lost in Israel. For eight chapters, he's been revealing the truth that is thrilling to anybody who's saved by Grace, but the truth is devastating to the unbeliever, especially to the unbelieving person of the Jewish faith, because he had been the recipient of such great amounts of truth. He felt an obligation to reach out to those who did not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so notice the burden on his heart as he opens up in these first five verses. So we'll go through uh, one through five, verse by verse, by verse and we're going to notice five things, some directly related to Paul. And some to God and God's connection to his people, Israel. We're going to see Paul's honesty, his heaviness, and his hunger. We're going to see God's gift to Israel. We're also going to see God's grace to Israel in the first five verses of Romans 9. So start with the first one. Verse 1, we see Paul's honesty. He says, I speak the truth. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. He's using the Holy Spirit as kind of a witness. Say like, hey, as God is my witness, as the Holy Spirit is my witness, I'm being truthful and honest. All lost people, even people of the Jewish faith, have looked, at, have looked with distrust and looked with doubt at the message of the cross. So Paul has shared a lot of truth, truth that outside of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, there is no hope. Of salvation. So some people hearing the message of Paul might have been tempted to think Paul's lying. Right? Remember Paul's history. His original name was Saul. There was a, he was a persecutor of the early church that began in Jerusalem. And in, it, and in Acts, he's named as, as among as those who approved of the stoning of, of Stephen. And then in Acts 9, we see that the story of Paul encountering the resurrected Jesus in the Damascus Road. This incident leads Paul to, to trust Jesus as the Messiah, and he devotes all of his energy from that point on to proclaim the message of Jesus 
to fellow Jews and especially the nations often called the Gentiles. And so through his preaching, through his writing, Paul stripped bare the hypocritical and the legalistic sham of rabbinical Judaism, right? Which is such a, 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 a scalding condemnation of Judaism as we see in Paul's letters, right? So some, some people of the Jewish faith probably felt like outcasts, hopelessly written off by God forever. And yet Paul wants these people to know that, that, that he has a heart for them, that he has a heart for them, that he wants them to see that he is sincere about what he's saying, about what he really does, how he does care. And that is why he calls the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to testify to his honesty. Paul wants them to know his message is absolutely true. It's vital that we as followers of Christ, that believers operate from an honest heart. This world must know that we love them and that we are connect and we're concerned about them. And John warns us about a false love. He told us that true love manifests itself in action on behalf of others, 1 John 3, 18. So we must give them no reason to mistrust us or the gospel message that we preach. We we must never be guilty of saying anything that's untrue, hypocritical to those outside the family of God that we can only hope that we'll that they'll have a faith and be able to come to Jesus. And there was a story or a moment or opportunity where I, I had that. I had to, the ability to be burdened to point somebody to Christ. I was helping a friend across the street, a good friend of mine, move. Um, it was a rainy day, so it was a really great day for a move. And, you know, a bunch of guys from church had shown up to help um, with the move. And as we're, like, unloading all the heavy stuff into the U-Haul, guy walks up on the street, you know, dressed very nice. He's got a briefcase of stuff. He was a Jehovah's Witness, right in the middle of the move. So the, and we're, most of the guys are, are Christians. We're part of a small group together. We're also, like, focused on moving. So there's this kind of, like, who's going to talk to this guy? So that was me. Um, <laughs> and I didn't help with the move because um, I spent an hour and a half in the rain talking to this Jehovah's Witness. I let him share his story, right, share his heart, explain to me what the gospel was. I wanted to hear what the gospel was from his perspective as a Jehovah's Witness. Right? And then when the time was right, because, you know, I, I, I shared my faith, and I share what I believed in, in Jesus Christ and how he's my Lord and Savior. Yeah, we're the same, man. We're absolutely the same. And I said, we're not the same. I'm so sorry. I said, we are not the same. And he got this look of concern on his face and this disconnect. Um, I think he was excited because this is the most somebody has engaged with him in quite a while. Um, and he thought he was getting somewhere. And I didn't mean to mislead him, but I wanted to tell him the honest truth. His name was Kenyatta. Um, and I said, Kenyatta, I'm, I'm scared for you. I'm scared that you don't know what you're involved with and that you don't know the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man. They don't believe in the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection, what's the point of the gospel? They do not believe that he was equal to God the Father. They don't even believe in the Trinity. And that salvation is all about works. It's about what you do. I was just talking to my friend Marv in the back. The entire life, you're working to earn favor towards God as a Jehovah's Witness. That's not the gospel that Paul teaches and preaches. I wanted that honest truth to be apparent to Kenyatta as I spoke to him with bewilderment in his eyes. And as we're both soaking wet and my friends had already left with the moving truck, I said, I would love to pray for you. Can I pray for you? And he said, no. He looked at me like I was crazy, right? Um, and I said, Kenyatta, I'm either going to pray for you out here or I'm going to go in my house and I'm going to pray for you. And he's like, you can, you can do whatever you want. And we parted ways. Um, 
my hope with that man was that he could know my honesty, my honest heart. That know that I was being truthful, know that I cared, and ultimately my heart was burdened to point him to Christ. I don't know, you know, what's going to happen. I don't know what questions he has. I don't know what he, man, went back to his church and his friends. Like, There's this weird guy on the street who talked to me for an hour and then didn't listen to anything I said. I don't know what, what happened with him. Um, in a similar sense, you know, Paul doesn't know what's going to happen to all the Jews that hear and receive his message. So let's jump to verse 2. Well, you're going to see Paul's heaviness in verse 2. He says, I have great sorrow. I have unceasing anguish in my heart. So Paul is telling his readers that his life is paralyzed by this constant grief. The words here used to refer to those who are overcome by mourning. Paul wants his readers to know that he's operating under a heavy burden for the lost. Paul's heart is broken over the condition of the lost sinner. He lives under this constant weight, this constant burden of the reality of their state. And the fact that their perishing lies on his shoulders like a weight that's impossible to carry. So this is the kind of burden that we should all be under. This is the kind of burden that we should have for the people around us, families, friends, coworkers, neighbors, acquaintances. We're surrounded by millions of people who don't know Jesus, who don't trust Jesus, who don't trust Christians, who don't trust the church, or maybe act like they don't really care. And we live our lives and we attend church and our services and we kind of keep our heads down and we do our own thing. We never give the millions of people around us a second thought. When's the last time you were burdened to pray for somebody? When's the last time that God woke you up in the middle of the night and brought to mind that person that you know needs to know him? And sadly, most of us aren't affected by the condition of the lost, and we need a heart check to remember that we walked where they once walked, that we lived how they once lived, and we have the desire to offer life-changing truth of Jesus to others. And so the reason I seem so forward and so blunt about this is because I felt this weight for a friend, I felt this weight for a family member, or somebody I've met, and I've done nothing. So I'm not just speaking to you, I'm speaking to myself. There's another story that I wanted to share with you where it was not as productive or as fruitful with my friend Kenyatta, the Jehovah's Witness. I was studying at UW Milwaukee. I was in, uh, studying for religious studies and Hebrew studies. So once you get to a certain stage in your studies as you're going through classes, you start kind of taking classes with the same group of people because they're all pursuing the same major degree. And there was a man, so we're, you know, early 20s, me and my friends in that class. And there was a man in that class who was in his 40s going back to school. And his name was Tad. He was a great man. He was an awesome guy to talk to. He was fun. He loved music. Um, he, was, he could totally shred on a guitar, um, and he could smack me upside down with his knowledge of Scripture, and he was not a believer. He actually prided himself in being a skeptic. Um, he just didn't trust God's Word. He didn't trust the Bible, but he knew it better than everybody in the class and maybe the professor. And Tad had had shared stories to us over the several semesters we were together of how he had multiple near-death experiences because of drugs or overdose or whatever it would be um, to the point where he'd been brought back by doctors and the doctor saying, you should not be alive. You should not be here. And I was young and I was scared and I was afraid and I didn't know how to talk to a guy like that who knew so much about Scripture, who knew more about Jesus than I did from a knowledge perspective, but didn't call himself a Christian, didn't profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And my, one of my friends in our class, again, we're just young 20-something guys, and he's like, my friend said this about Tad. He, he said, 
he would have been such a warrior for the kingdom. And my hope is that he will be one day, right? Because I can pray for him now. But in those moments when I was interacting with him, I was just flabbergasted at his knowledge and his understanding of who Jesus was and yet rejecting him, right? And so we see that rejection happening here in the beginning of Romans 9, right? And we see that kind of as we go through verses 3, 4, and 5, right? Paul's um, hunger for the Jewish people, how God gives them gifts to, to Israel and how God gives grace. So let's look at verse 3, Paul's hunger. <clears throat> so he says, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race. And in verse 4 he says, the people of Israel. So this means that Paul's people, his upbringing, his worldview in which he came from, his kinsmen, right, are accursed and they're separated from Christ. And so he softens the statement of their loss by its expressing it in relation to his own anguish. But the reality is unmistakable. They're, they're accursed. They're accursed and cut off from Christ. They're lost. They're on their way to hell under the judgment of God. So the word for accursed here is an anathema in Greek, anathema. And it's used in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, where Paul says, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed, anathema. So now, why, the question is, why are Paul's people, his people, the Jews, accursed and cut off from Christ, right? And Paul gives two answers. One is that they've stumbled over Jesus Christ as the, the goal of the law, and they've rejected him as the one to bear their curse and to be their righteousness. And the other answer is that God has not chosen all ethnic Israel to be spiritual Israel. So I'm going to explain that. I'm going to skip ahead to Romans 9. Sorry, spoiler for next week. Uh, Romans, Romans 9.30, really briefly. Uh, Paul asks this question and a phrase that he uses a lot in a lot of his writing. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attain their goal? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Verse 33 says, as it is written, see I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Again, that's Romans 9, 30 through 33. So in other words, Paul pictures Christ as the righteousness that the law was pointing to. So all of the Old Testament law, all the work that they were doing points to the Messiah, points to Christ. And Gentiles, anyone non-Jewish, they saw it, believed, and were justified by faith. God attributed the righteousness of Christ to the Gentiles through their faith. But Israel, like Paul says later in Romans 9, stumbled over Christ. The Jewish people didn't see him as their Messiah or their righteousness or the one to whom the law was pointed to all along. So the, they, they saw it as a way to God's righteousness as works, not faith. And so they failed to attain what the law was pointing to. They stumbled over Christ. But who are the people that we know in our lives who tend to stumble over Christ, right, that misunderstand or are tripped up by him completely? And Paul refers to those who believe in Jesus as a one who will never be put to shame. So back to Paul's hunger in verse 3. Here in this verse, Paul makes a statement that's totally astounding. He says that if it were possible, he would allow himself to be separated from God, cut off from Christ, if it would save the lost Jewish people. What a statement. And Paul's not joking. He, he meant it. He knew that it was impossibility. He knew that he was eternally secure in the Lord Jesus, but he was willing in his heart to give up his salvation in Jesus so that others might be saved. What a burden. What a weight, what a heaviness that he carried around in his heart. And I wonder if we've ever been to a place where we would be willing to say a similar statement, to pray a similar prayer. Do I have the hunger for salvation for the world around me? Do I see others 
who are in need of Jesus the same way Paul sees his Jewish heritage and people. And I wonder if we're burdened enough to say, to, to burdened enough for others, right, that we would pray that, to the Lord to save them, regardless of what it looked like for us. Could we say, Father, if it means that I must be cursed and I must be cut off and separated from Christ for their sake, I'll do it. Right? When our burden grows to the place where it consumes us with its weight, will we say that kind of prayer? Will we get that serious? Will we speak to the Lord to speak to hearts and provide opportunities to share our faith and point people to Jesus? We're going to jump to verse 4. We've talked about Paul's honesty, his heaviness, and his hunger. We're going to talk about Paul's gifts to Israel. So Israel had been the recipients or partakers of a lot of gifts from God. They've been given truth and they've been given revelation. They were in a special covenant relationship with him and are his people. And all of the Old Testament prophets and prophecies were given to them, through them. All the promises concerning the Messiah and the coming kingdom were given to them. The people of Israel have been given more light than any other people group in their world, and yet they became so bogged down in the letter of the law and the religious rituals that they missed the Messiah when he came. There's one specific conversation that happened in the middle of the night with a Jewish religious leader in Jesus. It's recorded in John 3. If you want to turn there with me, you can. I'm going to have it on the screen as well. So it says in John 3, in the beginning of John 3, there's a Pharisee named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. So immediately, we see three things about him. We see his name, that he was a Pharisee, and that he was a member of the Jewish ruling council, also known as the Sanhedrin. So the Pharisees were a religious political party at the time, during the time of Jesus. They believed in Scripture. They believed in Old Testament miracles. They believed in, and, and, and they believed in actually, the, the bodily resurrection. They wanted to be free from Rome and establish the Davidic kingdom again. So as a Pharisee, this is how Nicodemus was seen and recognized. This is how he approaches Jesus. This was a part of his identity. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus at nighttime, perhaps so that he wouldn't be seen by others and have his allegiance and his beliefs suspected. So he approaches this great teacher with questions, with curiosity, with inquiries, and he ends up being tripped up, and he ends up being unmasked. And it's through the pressing and vulnerable conversation with Jesus that Nicodemus and his beliefs and his identity is stripped down. Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, this high-level religious leader who's benefited and received all the gifts that God has given to Israel. Nicodemus, the teacher, ends up being taught by Jesus. So Roman, I'm sorry, John 3, 11, Jesus says, You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you the earthly things, and you do not believe. How then you will believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So there Jesus gives us Jewish leader, the truth of salvation, right? About the purpose of his coming. This is one of the highest religious figures having a late night conversation with Jesus. And he still gets tripped up. Jesus says, aren't you Israel's teacher? You don't understand these things? Aren't you the guy in charge of all the religious elite around here? And you don't get it. I'm talking to you about earthly things. How do you expect to understand heavenly things? And it's easy to scoff and ridicule Nicodemus for missing the salvation message that Jesus is trying to unpack. But I wonder how far we've gone from the basic truths that Jesus teaches. How many churches miss the message that Jesus brings? What if the questions were, aren't you a Christian who wears a cross around your neck? Don't you go to that church with a big cross out front? Don't you know what that cross means? Don't you know what that cross represents? Do you know what Christ taught? Do you know what he said? What he is? And so the point is, we cannot move far from the truth of what Jesus speaks, of who he is. And Paul knows this. And Paul is burdened to get that truth to his people. 
The gifts that God gives to Israel are in a way a blessing and a gift to us. Without Israel, we would not have the channel which God gave Christ to the world. So we see God's gifts to Israel in verses 4 and 5, and we also see God's grace to Israel. God's grace to Israel. When this Messiah did come, he was born from among them as one of their own. No other people had ever had had such a privilege, right? Jesus, fully God, fully man, came from the Jewish people. God became man, was born among the Jewish people, and yet when he showed himself to them, they refused him. To come to that place, to arrive to that spot, they had to ignore every prophecy concerning him. They had to disregard every miracle and every proof that Jesus was the Messiah. How did they do away with Lazarus? How did they silence 5,000 people who experienced the feeding that Jesus did? What did they do with the 500 people who saw him after Christ was risen from the dead? You see how many hills and hurdles they had to get over to get past Jesus? And so the beauty of the gospel is that although Israel had missed Jesus, even though they had been blessed by the gifts that pointed to him, there is grace for them. Christ is Savior and Lord to all who come to him. And this includes God's chosen people. And so Paul ends this section, this Romans 1 through 5, with a doxology of sorts. He reminds his readers that Jesus, the Jesus that he is preaching, is no ordinary man. He's no fool who didn't know when to keep his mouth shut and got himself nailed to a cross. He closes this section by reminding us who Jesus is, that he, he is God. Like I said um, in the beginning of this message this morning, Lila gave out tons of pictures at camp of a fort. Um, campers and counselors probably like 50 or 60 of them. She was working so hard. And um, at the end of the week, I had received a letter from one of the counselors. Her name was Sage, and she just thanked me for, and my family for being there, for our time at camp, for the messages that I shared. And at the end of the, her note, she thanked my daughter, Lila, who's four, and can't read, right? So I had to read it to her and explain it to her. And she said, I will forever Sign my name with a cross because of you. And she signed it, Sage, with a little cross behind it. And I think most people see that. Sweet, it's simple. But the ultimate reality is the cross has the message of salvation, always. When my little girl signs her name with a cross, which who knows when she'll stop doing that, so I'm trying to soak it up now. She doesn't grasp the full pain and sacrifice that it represents. But she knows who died for her on that cross. You ask her, she'll tell you. She'll tell you Jesus. And by signing her name with a cross at the end, in her sweet and simple way, she is telling people about Jesus. So the point that I've been trying to get across this morning morning is that we need to be burdened to point people to Jesus. When I read Paul's words in Romans, particularly in the passage we went through this morning, I wish I could have his fervor. I wish I could have his his energy, his heart, his passion. Do you grieve, right? Do you feel the sorrow, the pain, and the anguish that Paul feels? Do you have that for your friends? Do you have that for your family, for your neighbors? People who are accursed and cut off from Christ. I know many of you do. Many of you have been probably praying for people for years. And that's good. We need to nurture that treat, that, that grief with the truth of God's word. And remember that Jesus said we should not only love those who love us, we also have to love our enemies, which is the hard part. To close, this is, I want you to know Paul's ultimate desire. We find this in Romans 10. Romans 10, verse 1. Just trying to figure out what Paul is saying. What are, you, what are you trying to get across? What's your desire? What's your hope? 
Paul, and he says this. Brethren, my heart's desire, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. It's for their salvation. The fruit of Paul's anguish for Israel, who are cursed and cut off from Christ, is to desire their salvation, to pray for them to be saved. Because Paul prayed for their salvation, I'll pray. Because Christ prayed on the cross for their salvation, I'll pray. Because I have grief and anguish in my heart for the people around me, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to be burdened to point people to Christ. And may God may even, might even do it right now. Right? If you're still under the guilt of your sins and accursed and cut off from Christ, don't stay there. Christ has become a curse for us. He died for our sins and risen from the dead. Trust him as your one and only hope and you will be saved. Please pray with me. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you that although at one point we were accursed and cut off from Christ, we were dead in our sins and our trespasses. We've been made alive not by any of our work, not by any of our efforts, by your grace alone, but by believing in Jesus Christ. We have a new life, a new hope, and a salvation. God, I pray for the things that are on our hearts and on our minds this morning. I pray for the people that we immediately think of. When we think about how we need to be a burden, to, we need to be burdened to point people to Christ, God, I want you to take that first person in our minds and allow us to be devoted and dedicated to being honest with them about our faith, to be truthful about the words that Jesus said, about the gospel message that everybody needs to hear. Even people that are we don't even know, that aren't friends, that aren't family, that aren't neighbors or acquaintances, but the people that were, thousands of millions of people that we're surrounded by all the time. God, I pray that we have a heart for them, that we can be burdened to point them to Christ. And the things we say, and how we act, and how we treat others, and how we love others. God, people will know we are followers of Christ by our love. I pray that for this church, for this congregation, for every individual here. that we can take the things that are weighing on our hearts and the people that are weighing on our hearts and be able to do something about it for you, God, and for your glory. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.